Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining me today on the show is one of India's most revered lawyers and currently the additional Solicitor General of India as well, Amarjeet Singh Chandiyok. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for agreeing to talk to us here on Bloomberg Thank TV you. India. Sir, in your long and illustrious career, have you ever seen the kind of litigation that we are seeing today, especially when it comes to India Inc., Corporate India, and the impact that it's having on it? You see, we'll have to go back to our policy decisions. We have changed, we opened our doors of economy. The moment we opened our doors and we have started having private and public partnerships, litigation towards commercial world had to change and it has started changing. Over the last decade, if you see the country's litigation, it has taken its turn totally to a commercial world, especially places like Delhi, which probably has today the maximum number of commercial litigations coming. So there is a total change in the scenario of litigation. People are now wanting to do work. People want to dispense justice. People want to have disputes resolved even at pre-litigation stages. Therefore, there is a total change in the system today that has been brought about. Do you believe somewhere, sir, that we are seeing excessive litigation and that could be largely also due to certain flaws in the way clarity is coming out or emerging out of policy making? You see, when you make new policies, you'll always have teething problems. And when you implement that policy, there's bound to have some conflicts. So those conflicts will lead to disputes. The only thing which we are looking forward now, and fortunately is taking its turn, is that we have brought the concept of mediation in a very, very big way in the country. The central government's policy, the state government policy. And fortunately for us, the court itself is coming into that. The raging debate, sir, today across India is that is the judiciary stepping into the domain of the executive? What are your views on this? I feel, if you ask me, it may not be really correct to say that it's going into the field of domain of executive. Because at certain times the court finds that it has to intervene for the welfare of the people. It needs to look at it. But whenever you are doing that, it's bound to overlap that situation. I understand there is a Lakshman Rekha which the court should not proceed. But in given circumstances, there could be cases where the court will have to do it. There are cases and cases where court finds, I may not be able to get the implementation through an executive order. Or there may be certain political compulsions. There could be welfare comp compulsions of the government to do it. So the court intervenes to say, I must get this done. So the court has really looked at itself. It takes its restraint on a policy matter unless it finds it's totally absurd. Even in the case of 2G, court has not commented on the policy of the government, whether it was India, whether it's UPA 1 or UPA 2, it, the manner in which you have implemented that policy may be a subject matter of consideration. But the policy is not ever commented by the court. So one of the big landmark decisions we saw last year was the entire presidential reference. The court even asked stakeholders to come before it, perhaps unprecedented, where even corporate India and its associations were asked to. Uh, it did pass an order where it very clearly said that, look, policy is the domain of the government That's and right. we'll only step in where we find certain That's wrongdoing. Right. And then, again, you have the FDI in retail, uh, again a policy decision where the court has now stepped in uh, to ask why have so many people not applied so far, etc., etc. I'm not going into the specifics that matter is before the Honorable Court. That's right. But do you think somewhere still there seems to be a willingness on the part of the judiciary to step in and could that be because there is a general perception that the executive has been weak? I think the public perception is really taking the toll and that is where the role of the common man comes in. You don't understand the repercussions of that if the court was to intervene. Therefore, time will have to come, as in fact it has come to my mind, where you will have to rely upon the executive for its wisdom to do something in Parliament, because Parliament is supreme, subject to restriction which the court itself has laid down for the Parliament, that you would not abridge my fundamental rights. Therefore, you must allow the executive to lay down its policy, allow that policy to work. As I said, a new policy is bound to bring some conflicts, some teething problem. Allow people to do that. And certainly if the court finds that the government or the executive is doing something in excessive of its power, or it's totally arbitrary, if served, then certainly court will have to intervene. But to that domain, I think the court must restrict itself not to go into the domain of that. You said you feel the time has already come. It already started come. happening. Where is your optimism coming from, sir? Because we continue to see even more litigation. No, we are doing that. But probably therefore I am saying we, we all sitting in our particular domains must understand 
that we must restrict ourselves. It's a self-restraint. Unless you put out self-regulations, and I've been saying that even quite judiciary, if the judiciary will not to self-regulate itself, time will come one day, the executive will intervene and say, please set your record straight. Because you can't have a system to always intervene into somebody else's domain. If I was to sit in parliament and enact a law, the court might say it infringes something in the constitution. So straight away, please strike it down. But don't enact law. You can't say law should be like this. You might have to strike it down and go, the wisdom of the parliament will once again prevail to say what it wants to do in the light of that judgment. So one of the big issues that dominated last year was the entire issue of retrospectivity. And we got a lot of flack from it from global investors. While I don't want to go into any specific here, I just want your larger view because there was a feeling that the government will correct that. It hasn't so far. The view from the government is we will try and address this specific case. Once we've addressed this specific case, we'll bring in an amendment to the parliament to do away with retrospectivity. Right. In the meantime, there have been several cases filed before different high courts, specific cases again. Where do you see this coming to an end from? Because the issue there really was not about one entity. It was about you changed your tax law, you changed the ruling of your highest apex court. That really is what got us the flag. You see, first of all, let us see the jurisdiction of the parliament. To my mind, parliament has jurisdiction to even to take the basis of any judgment and enact a law. It has also jurisdiction and competence to pass a law which is retrospective. Because it could be possible that when it enacted an earlier law, that was not stood the test of judicial scrutiny. Therefore, it would be within its jurisdiction or competence to enact a law to correct that error which it did and bring it retrospectively. Now, without going into anything particular, now if the state or the government feels that you are doing a transaction outside the country, but the transaction affects something in country, I find it's within the competence of the parliament to enact a law to tax that, especially in the fiscal statutes. And the Supreme Court time and again has said, I'll give you more leverage when it comes to fiscal statutes.